Hello viewers, today I'm going to be sharing a story with you and it's a story that most Jehovah's Witnesses are entirely unfamiliar with. It relates to a double standard that was applied to Jehovah's Witnesses living in two countries, namely Mexico and Malawi in the 60s, 70s and 80s. This was basically a story of hypocrisy of the Watchtower Society betraying Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi and as I go through the details of this awful set of circumstances hopefully you will understand why I am using such strong language in particular the word betrayal in the title of this video. I thought we would begin by looking at two videos that were produced by the Watchtower Society for Jehovah's Witnesses last year in 2018. Both touch on the persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi in the period discussed, namely the 60s, 70s and early 80s. Both are produced for the purpose of Number one, reminding Jehovah's Witnesses that they as a religion are persecuted because after all, um, the fact that Witnesses are persecuted, so say Watchtower leaders, just proves that they are Jesus' true disciples. But the, another reason why these videos were produced was to draw parallels between the ban of Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi and the banning or the recent banning of Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia. And indeed, Russia is directly alluded to in both videos if you watch them. So we're going to begin with the first of these two videos. I'm writing these letters to Russia because sometime back here in Malawi we had the same problem, so I'm feeling sorry for my brothers there. Well, we feel for our brothers in Russia because we know what the brothers went through in this country. And so we certainly want to do our best to give support to this letter writing campaign so that our brothers in Russia will feel that we're right behind them. When the work was under ban in Malawi, brothers all over the world wrote letters to the government. I was born in the refugee camp in Mozambique. My parents had to free Malawi because our freedom of worship was severely restricted. I feel strongly about this letter writing campaign to our brothers in Russia because it's got a great meaning to me. It really happened here. The very same thing that's happening in Russia, it happened here. Our grandparents used to tell us stories about uh, the restrictions that they had. They couldn't uh, meet freely as we're doing now, and um, they had to meet at night time. So again, it's very obvious from this brief video that the aim is to draw parallels between the, the ban in Russia, which is a fairly recent development. It started only in the last couple of years and the situation in Malawi that existed for, as you saw there, 26 years. And a few things are mentioned or alluded to in that brief clip. It talks about missionaries being deported. It talks about Jehovah's Witnesses being imprisoned in refugee camps. And it refers toward the end there to meetings being restricted or interrupted in some way. Now, granted, this was a fairly short video and arguably Watchtower didn't have time to necessarily go through um, the worst elements of the persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi. But we have another video, again released the same year in 2018. This video was actually shown towards the end of the three-day Be Courageous Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses and even features a reenactment of the persecution in Malawi. Let's take a look. The persecution spread throughout Malawi soon after the announcement was made. 
that the witnesses were banned in the country. The truth is this, that people who call themselves Jehovah's Witness are not Jehovah's Witness at all. They are the devil's witness. Their houses were burned and their maize crops were confiscated because they refused to participate in the country's politics. The regular visits that Brother Johansen was doing as a branch representative at that time really encouraged the brothers from various parts of the country who were affected by the persecution. His wife, Linda, suggested that he should ask someone to accompany him so that he did not have to do the work alone. And she suggested that I accompany him. This was because of the fear of what might happen. When we got to the ferry crossing, the soldiers told Brother Johansen to get out and stand in front of the jeep. They said to me, you can pass, but we first have to shoot the white men. Because the scriptures say, no one has greater love than this, that someone should surrender his life in behalf of his friends. I said, shoot me instead. What did this man do? Yes, it happened without giving it a second thought. It just happened spontaneously. I stood between him and the soldiers. Prayer helped very much because the people that we thought were going to harm us had a complete change of heart. On the way back, Brother Johansen also saved my life. We were stopped by a youth mob at a roadblock. They asked for the political cards. They would have killed me. So Brother Johansen just sped off with his vehicle. Yes, it was very exciting to see that Jehovah God has many ways of saving his people. Elisha said, for there are more who are with us than those who are with them. In the end, Jehovah will rescue his people. So, in countries where our brothers are banned, I encourage them to stand firm, trusting in God, the God who never fails, Jehovah. So there were a few extra details in this video that just served to broaden our perspective on how bad things were in Malawi and I've added these to the graphic that I showed you earlier. We saw there that the leadership were talking about Jehovah's Witnesses as being the devil's witnesses so you know we can imagine how that kind of rhetoric would have played out among Jehovah's Witnesses back then but more urgently uh, we're told that Jehovah's Witness houses were burned that maize crops were confiscated. We have a story of a missionary, a foreign missionary named Brother Johansson, who is threatened. We have uh, Brother Johansson and Lloyd Liquide. I've probably mispronounced that surname. I'm just going to refer to him as Lloyd and hope that you don't get confused because my name's Lloyd. But Lloyd uh, and Brother Johansson were attacked in their car by an angry mob and they felt that their life was in danger. And bizarrely, when talking about all these experiences, Lloyd says it was very exciting to see that Jehovah God has many ways of saving his people. Yes, it was very exciting to see that Jehovah God has many ways of saving his people. So in referring to a situation where a religious minority is under attack, their property is being burned, their livelihood is being compromised through their crops being confiscated, and indeed their very lives are under threat, all of this is apparently exciting. And I found it intriguing as well, and I'm going to come back to this, that of all of the anecdotes that Watchtower could have featured in this reenactment, 
about the persecution in Malawi, the most compelling story that they could think to show at the 2018 convention to highlight this persecution was a fairly uneventful story in which a missionary um, and his associate have a, a tense exchange with some guards, which ends amicably, and they get their car surrounded by a mob and they prevail. They they drive off. This this was the most compelling story that Watchtower felt they needed to focus on to convey what was happening in Malawi in these years to compare it to and you'd have to watch the whole thing in context but to compare it to what's happening in Russia at the moment where the Putin regime has essentially outlawed Jehovah's Witnesses declared it an extremist group I've spoken on this channel about my feelings about this I feel that the Jehovah's Witness leadership should be held responsible for abuse by governments, but to ban a religion is to encroach on people's freedom of worship. But anyway, I'm, I'm going off track at this point. The reason why I've shown you those two videos is because I find it fascinating that what happened in Malawi, which is just which was a nightmare scenario, and I'm going to explain why but it has been essentially downplayed by Watchtower. The worst, the worst of the persecution, if we take those two videos together, the worst of the persecution was houses being burned and maize crops being confiscated and people being threatened. If we, if we use those two videos to, to draw a picture of what happened, I'm going to give you another picture of what happened in Malawi in those years and bearing in mind that there are probably going to be believing Jehovah's Witnesses watching this I hope you guys will indulge me for a moment I'm going to show you official Watchtower quotes about Malawi but I'm going to begin with a book called Crisis of Conscience which you may have heard of it was written by a former governing body member named Raymond Franz and I'm going to compare what Raymond Franz wrote with what was written in official Watchtower printed material. And before I read this quote, I just want to warn you that there's going to be some very shocking material covered uh, in this quote. So this is a quote from Crisis of Conscience. Beginning in 1964, Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi began to experience persecution and violence on a scale rarely equaled in modern times. Successive waves of vicious countrywide attacks and brutality by savage mobs swept over them in 1964, 1967, 1972 and again in 1975. In the first attack, 1,081 Malawian families saw their little homes burned or otherwise demolished. 588 fields of crops destroyed. In the 1967 attacks, witnesses reported the rapings of more than 1,000 of their women. One mother being sexually violated by six different men her 13-year-old daughter, by three men. At least 40 of the women were reported to have suffered miscarriages due to this. In each wave of violence, beatings, torture and even murder went virtually unchecked by the authorities and reached such intensity that thousands of families fled their homes and fields to neighbouring countries. In 1972, authoritative estimates were that 8,975 fled to Zambia, 11,600 to Mozambique. When violence subsided, in time the families filtered back to their homeland, 
Then a new wave forced them to flee again. Adding to the tragedy of all this were the reports coming out of the camps of small children dying because of lack of medicine and medical treatment. I think you'll agree with me that that puts the whole issue of the persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi in an entirely different light. We're talking here about simply unspeakable savagery. We're talking about rape. We're talking about murder. And when you, when you compare this with what was covered in those two videos that I showed you earlier, the, the situation seems unrecognizable. And just to highlight that what Raymond Franz is saying here wasn't an exaggeration, allow me to quote uh, from a 1968 watchtower. So a watchtower that was printed while this was happening. It says, at Lilongwe in central Malawi, 170 homes of these Christians were burned down in three nights. In the Fort Johnston district, slightly to the south, 34 homes and 18 food storage places were burned down toward the end of October. At Mabalame on October 27th, the Christians of two congregations all had their homes burned down while they, including the women, were stripped of their clothes and brutally beaten. Now I want to share with you a quote from the 1999 yearbook, which is truly chilling. It says, For some of our dear sisters, the persecution was especially harrowing. Many were the reports of rape, mutilation and beating of Christian women. The sadistic attackers spared nobody. The elderly, the young, and even some pregnant sisters were put through such cruel ordeals. Some suffered miscarriages as a result. The vicious attacks claimed many lives. In Cape Maclear, at the southern end of Lake Malawi, bundles of grass were tied around Zelfat Mbeko. Petrol was poured on the grass and set alight. He was literally burned to death. Sisters also suffered terribly. Following their refusal to buy party cards, many were repeatedly raped by party officials. In Lilongwe, Sister Magola, along with many others, tried to flee the trouble. However, she was pregnant and could not run very fast. A mob acting like a pack of wild dogs, caught up with her and beat her to death. At the campus of Bunda College of Agriculture, just outside of Lilongwe, six brothers and one sister were murdered and their bodies were horribly mutilated. Apologies if that sort of graphic imagery of violence is... Um, is too shocking for you. It's it, it's difficult for me to process that kind of, again, savagery and barbarity. But just to kind of go back to this comparison, so we're talking now about homes burned, which was covered in the 2018 videos, food storage burned, which again was sort of alluded to, but we can add to that women stripped of clothing and beaten, women raped and mutilated, miscarriages due to abuse, Zelfat and Bako being burned alive, pregnant sister Magola being beaten to death, and multiple murders and bodies mutilated. I think you will agree that those two videos released last year were in many ways a disservice to the memories of those who suffered in Malawi unspeakable crimes 
and in the face of Jehovah's Witnesses being raped and murdered under the most horrifying circumstances, we have a video in which Lloyd Li Liquide says, it was very exciting to see that Jehovah God has many ways of saving his people. Apparently, the thing for Jehovah's Witnesses to focus on is that one missionary and his associate got out of a sticky situation. That's what we need to think about. Uh, and the message being that Jehovah saves. Well, what was Jehovah doing for all of those victims of rape and murder? And at this point, you, you might be thinking, is this what your video is about, Lloyd? Are you just sitting here complaining about two videos that don't quite do justice to the persecution suffered by Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi. No, I'm not. This is not what this video is about, although I do think it's something to think about. The question is raised when we look at this disparity between the 2018 videos and the material that I've shared with you. The question is raised, why would Watchtower downplay what happened in Malawi because that's what they seem to be doing from my perspective and it's possible that it was because they for example the the convention video maybe they were mindful of the fact that there were children in the audience they didn't want to scare the children although frankly when you look at some of the other material that was shown to children in that convention including fields of dead bodies um, in a propaganda video that's designed to prepare witnesses for Armageddon, I'm not sure that that's an entirely defensible reason. But certainly, when you're conveying this information and there are children present, you'd want to do it in, in a very sensitive way. I just can't understand why they wouldn't refer to some of these atrocities at all. One possible reason could be, and this is just purely speculation on my part, one reason why Watchtower might want to downplay what happened in Malawi is because they were partly responsible for it. And if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, at this point you're thinking, whoa, hold on a minute. How could Watchtower possibly be responsible in any way for the savagery that was inflicted on Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi by the regime. Well, that's the horrifying part, and that's why I've titled this video The Betrayal, The Betrayal of Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi, uh, due to the double standard, because there was a double standard. If you're watching this and you have no knowledge of Jehovah's Witnesses, by this point you're probably wondering, why were Jehovah's Witnesses rounded on like this? What possible reason could the Malawian authorities have had to uh, persecute Jehovah's Witnesses in this way? Well, the actual reason was that Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi refused to buy a party card that was compulsory for citizens of that country because of the government. The government in Malawi at that time was essentially a dictatorship. It was a single-party state, and all citizens had to buy a card showing their allegiance to the local political party. In fact, if we look at the 1976 Awake, it says this. It says, it is because Jehovah's Witnesses refuse to buy the Malawi Congress party card. This card declares the holder to be a member of the ruling political party of Malawi. But for Jehovah's Witnesses to buy a political card and thus join a political party would be an open denial of what they believe and stand for. And here is a photograph of what that card looked like. This is the card that witnesses were persecuted for not possessing. But just to explain further, 
the reason why Jehovah's Witnesses were not supposed to buy this card is because Jehovah's Witnesses aspire to what's referred to as Christian neutrality. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, you are supposed to be separate from all political elements of Satan's system of things. You're not to be involved in politics in any way, and you're certainly not to be involved in the military. Anything basically that represents an apparatus of the political infrastructure of the world you're supposed to completely avoid as a Jehovah's Witness. So that was the thinking behind Jehovah's Witnesses essentially being banned from buying this card that they were required to have, even though this was a single party state. And we can think of the 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 party card as being almost equivalent to having a passport. A passport just declares you to be a citizen of a country. This particular country, because it was a dictatorship, required its citizens to all be members of the political party. It's not like it's not like they had any choice. It's not like there was a choice of different political parties. This was just a a card that all members all citizens of the country were required to have. So now we come to Watchtower's involvement in all this, because you could be thinking as a Jehovah's Witness, well, you can't blame Watchtower for having these high standards, um, because these standards are applied all around the world for Jehovah's Witnesses. We're not to be part of Satan's system of things, and if that means that we are persecuted by regimes like that in Malawi, then that's a price we're willing to pay as per the early Christians in ancient Rome when they were persecuted by Emperor Nero, etc. The trouble is that not all Jehovah's Witnesses are held to these standards or, or they weren't held to these standards in the period in question. And all of this is brought to light in the previously mentioned book by Raymond Franz, Crisis of Conscience, although there is an excellent write-up of this whole issue on jwfacts.com. I'm going to leave a link in the description if you want to do more research. In fact, I would encourage you to do more research. This video is really just to outline some of the issues. But just to put things simply, at the same time that Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi were being rounded up and raped and beaten and murdered a situation existed in Mexico that amounted to a betrayal of these witnesses in Malawi because witnesses in Mexico were allowed to entirely compromise their Christian neutrality over the issue of Cartier cards a Cartier card was a, a piece of paper that that declared that you had undertaken basic military service. All males were required to do basic military service, and this Cartier card basically had your had your photograph on, and it was stamped, and it said, this person has done basic military service, and therefore he can have a passport. You, you, can't, you couldn't get a passport as a young man in Mexico without one of these cards, it would have been problematic to get various types of employment without one of these cards. So, although it wasn't a life or death situation, you were at a disadvantage as a Jehovah's Witness if you didn't have one of these Cartier cards. And the way they could be obtained was through bribery. If you hadn't done the basic military service, you could literally pay a Mexican government official and they would stamp the card for you to say that you'd done the training. So the Mexican branch wrote to Watchtower headquarters in New York asking whether it was appropriate for Jehovah's Witness men, including some high-ranking witnesses, including circuit overseers, including witnesses who were working at Bethel, they asked Watchtower headquarters, is it appropriate for... 
witnesses to be engaging in this bribery for this Cartier card. And Watchtower wrote back a letter dated June 2nd, 1960. And here's the relevant part. If members of the military establishment are willing to accept such an arrangement upon the payment of a fee, then that is the responsibility of these representatives of the national organization. In such a case, the money paid does not go to the military establishment, but is appropriated by the individual who undertakes the arrangement. If the consciences of certain brothers allow them to enter into such an arrangement for their continued freedom, we have no objection. Of course, if they would get into any difficulties over their course of action, then they would have to shoulder such difficulties themselves and we could not offer them any assistance. But if the arrangement is current down there and is recognised by the inspectors who do not make any inquiries into the veracity of the matter, then the matter can be passed by for the accruing advantages. So Watchtower writes to the Mexican branch and basically gives them the green light to bribe Mexican officials to get a Cartier card, which wasn't a matter of life or death, as was the case in Malawi. This was just something that had advantages for witnesses living in Mexico. And Watchtower says, it's okay, you go ahead, um, we're not going to raise an issue. If your consciences will allow you to do this, we're fine with it. So then a period of time goes by, and in August 1969, so nine years later, the Mexican branch writes back to Watchtower because they're not too sure whether Watchtower fully understands the ramifications of what's being discussed here, particularly in relation to what I was saying earlier about Christian neutrality and the fact that witnesses aren't to have any involvement at all in Satan's political system of things. And here's the relevant part of their letter dated August 27th, 1969. After checking back in the files, we have found a letter dated February 4th, 1960, number 123, in which the question was asked as to what to do because many were paying a sum of money to obtain the legal document given to those of draft age. However, it was not mentioned in the question that when this document is obtained, it places the receiver in the first reserve, subject to being called if and when an emergency should arise, which the army in uniform could not handle. So our question is this, does this change the policy set out in your letter of June 2nd, 1960, page 2, which answered our letter mentioned above? So the Mexican branch is here saying, look, we didn't tell you this, but when you own a Cartier card, you're essentially in Me the Mexican Reserve Army. You are eligible to be called up for military service in the event of a national emergency where the regular army is under-equipped. So there's a real conflict here between the whole Christian neutrality that Jehovah's Witnesses are supposed to have and what Watchtower is telling the Mexican branch that they are allowed to do. And Watchtower writes back in a letter dated September 5th, 1969, Dear brothers, we have your letter of August 27th in which you ask a question about brothers who had registered in Mexico and are now in the first reserves. The letter that you quoted of February 4th, 1960 covers the whole matter. There is nothing more to be said. The responsibility will be upon these individuals if they are ever called up as to what they are going to do and that is soon enough to take any action. In the meantime, these brothers who have registered and who have paid a fee are free to go ahead in the service. Not that we are giving our approval in this matter, but it is their conscience, not ours, that has allowed them to take the course of action that they have taken. 
if their conscience allows them to do what they have done and they are not compromising in any way, then you just lay the matter on the shelf. There is no reason for you to answer any questions or give comment to individuals nor to enter into a discussion. Someday we may have to face the issue and they may have to make a decision as the letter points out and then it will be for them to decide. We cannot decide the lives of everyone in the world. If the consciences of these persons allowed them to do what they did and to be registered in the reserves, that is for them to worry about if they are worried. It is not for the society's office to be worried about it. This was just a total abnegation of responsibility. This was Watchtower putting its head in the sand and saying, la la la, I can't hear anything. Uh, hear no evil, see no evil. We're just going to let you guys go ahead and completely ignore the fact that on the other side of the Atlantic, there are Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi who are being rounded up and beaten and raped and burned alive and bru brutally massacred. How could they have allowed this double standard? How, what was so special about witnesses in Mexico so that they could be allowed this special exemption when their lives weren't on the line? It's not like they were being rounded up and beaten and raped and murdered. This was purely an issue of convenience. This was purely an issue of, I'd like to have a passport. I'd like to be a able to apply for certain jobs whereas in Malawi over the same issue of Christian neutrality their lives were literally on the line and Watchtower stood back and let it happen even though they knew how bad things were even though they knew about the brutality and I'm going to uh, read one final quote because I was flicking through some of my old bound volumes for, you know, for, for some of the stories that were printed by Watchtower at that time. And I found a bound volume, the, the 1976 bound volume, and it had uh, insight on the news. You can probably see it there. And here's what it had to say about what was going on in Malawi. Jehovah's Witnesses are undergoing brutal persecution beatings, rape, even murder in the Southeast African nation of Malawi. Why? Solely because they maintain Christian neutrality and thus refuse to buy political cards that would make them members of the Malawi Congress Party. But the brutality they have experienced has stirred consciences everywhere. When will Malawi's public officials become so conscience-stricken that they bring an end to the brutal persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses? And I read that, and the feelings of rage that kind of well within me. I try to kind of not get too angry or hot-headed over these issues, but... They're talking about the need to look into one's conscience while this situation is still in play, while they have the opportunity to make the same allowance for Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi and say, oh, well, it's a conscience matter. You know, this is, you need this party political card in order to avoid being raped and beaten and murdered. So we'll let you we'll make it a matter of conscience and it's up to you and you know hear no evil see no evil why wouldn't they allow that and they have the cheek to talk about conscience this was as i mentioned in the title of my video and hopefully now i've explained everything you understand that it was a betrayal a betrayal of jehovah's witnesses in malawi and this is not to say that the Malawian regime doesn't bear responsibility 
for the brutality and barbarity that it brought to bear on Jehovah's Witnesses, they absolutely need to be held to account. No citizen of any country should be brutalized by its government purely because it refuses to get a piece of paper. The, the people who are responsible for doing this, for stirring up the mobs, for, for committing these atrocities, they absolutely need to be brought to justice. And I don't want there to be any confusion over that. You know, these are atrocities that were perpetrated by monsters who need to be brought to book. However, Watchtower does bear some culpability if only because at the same time they were making allowances in another part of the world, arguably closer to home in Mexico, they were letting witnesses with far less at stake, who, who were under far less risk, make the compromises that they denied to witnesses in Malawi. This was a true double standard. In fact, it's I think the chapter in Ray Franz's book that outlines all this, and I would encourage you to read it for more information, I think it's actually called Double Standard. And if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, the question you need to ask is, how could this be Jehovah's Organization when such a horrendous double standard is applied to worshippers to the point where Again, lives are put in danger. So that's my summary of the Mexico-Malawi betrayal. Again, for more information, I would encourage you to go to the relevant page on JW Facts where you can find scans of all the relevant documents. I do need to add as well that this too is a video that my patrons asked me to make as one of the monthly uh, voted videos. So I need to thank my patrons for suggesting this topic. It's been a difficult topic to go through because, wow, how do you get your head around that kind of savagery and that kind of double standard? But it's something that needs to be talked about. So I hope you have found this video informative. Please don't forget to subscribe for more videos. And as always, thank you for watching. Thank <laughs> you.